The 2019 solar winds hack represents a new threat milestone in the technology industry. The hackers, they patiently waited and evolved their intrusion over several years, literally. They lived in stealth. They tested and they retested their techniques and used very sophisticated methods to get into email systems, networks, authentication systems, and numerous points in the software supply chain to replicate the malicious code at massive scale. They would use techniques like inserting malware and then they would steal data and then they would remove the code before it was discovered. And they used many other advanced approaches to cover their tracks. The really scary thing about this breach is, you know, people often think, oh, well, I'm good, thankfully, I don't use solar winds. But it's not true, you're not safe. Because the domino effect of this hack, it's created a massive, massive concerns throughout the industry. We actually, to this day, we don't know the true scope of this attack and we don't even know who was impacted. We may never know. So connecting all the dots on this breach is extremely difficult. Moreover, new threats like those exposed in the recent Log4j vulnerability, they seem to hit the news like weekly and they further underscore the risks that organizations face. Not just large companies, by the way, small businesses, mid-sized organizations and individuals. Hello, my name is Dave Vellante and welcome to theCUBE's special look at managing risk in the digital supply chain, made possible by Red Hat. Today, we're going to hear from some of the top experts that will help you better understand how to think about the exposures in the software supply chain, some of the steps that we can all take to reduce our risks, and how an endless game of escalation is likely going to play out over the next decade. Up next is our first segment hosted by Dave Nicholson of theCUBE. He's with Luke Hines and Vincent Danen of Red Hat. They're going to talk about where the greatest threats exist and how to think about open source versus other commercial software and discuss ways that organizations can reduce their risk going forward. Let's get started. Welcome to theCUBE, I'm Dave Nicholson and this is part of a continuing conversation about managing risk in the digital supply chain. I have with me today Vincent Danen, Vice President of Product Security from Red Hat, and Luke Hines, Security Engineering Lead from the Office of the CTO at Red Hat. Gentlemen, welcome to theCUBE. Thank you. Great to be here. So let's just start out and dive right into this. Uh, Vincent, what is the software or digital supply chain? What are we talking about? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, Software supply chain is basically the uh, software that an end user would get from a vendor, or in our case, we're talking about uh, open source, so upstream. Um, it is the software that comes in uh, that is part of your uh, package, operating system, applications. Uh, it could be something that you get from one vendor, multiple vendors. Uh, so we look at, you know, in the example of Red Hat, we are one part of a customer's uh, software supply chain. So it's interesting that it's coming in from different areas. Uh, do we have a sense for the ratio of uh, kind of commercial software versus open source software that makes up an enterprise today? I think that's a really hard thing to answer. And I think every enterprise or every company would have it a little bit different. Uh, depends if you have uh, an open source vendor that you choose, you may get a significant amount of software from them. Uh, certainly you're not gonna get it all. Right. Uh, for an example, Red Hat provides thousands of open source packages. Uh, we certainly can't provide all of them. There are millions that are out there. Uh, so when you're looking at a specific application that you're building, chances are you could be running that on a managed platform uh, or an enterprise supplied platform. But there are going to be packages that you're going to be obtaining from other sources uh, in other communities as well in order to power your applications. So Luke, that sounds like a kind of a kind of a vague situation where we're looking at in terms of where all of our software is coming from. So so what do we need to know about our software supply chain in that context? What do we need to understand uh, before we even get anywhere near the idea of securing it? Uh, what are some of the issues that arise from that? Yes. Yeah, so as Vincent touched upon, it's, it's a very wide ranging ecosystem multiple sources when we're talking about open source. So essentially, awareness is key, really. I, I think a lot of people are really not aware of the sources that they're drawing from. 
to create their own supply chain. So there's there's multiple supply chains. You know, you can be there's somebody like Red Hat that that provides software. Okay, and then people will leverage Red Hat as a, for their own supply chain. You see, and uh, then you have the cloud provider, and they have their own source of software. So it's really, I think that the key thing is the awareness of of how much you rely upon that ecosystem. Before we look at the securing of, of the supply chain, it's really it's really understanding your supply chain. And just to follow up on that, what so get, can you? Uh, and I'm sort of checking my own level of understanding on this subject. Um, when you talk about open source code. Um, you're talking about a code base that is often maintained essentially by volunteers. Isn't that correct? A mix of volunteers and paid professionals where a company has an interest in the open source project. And, um, but predominantly, I would say, it's, well, I'm not entirely sure, but volunteers make up a substantial part of the, the ecosystem, that is for sure. So it's a mix, really. Some people do it uh, because they... They enjoy writing software. They want to share software. Okay. Other people also enjoy working software, but they're in the position that a company pays for them to, to work on that software. So it's a mix of both. Vincent, give us a reminder of, a reminder why, of why this is important from kind of a, a you know, a little bit of a higher level. Step back from, from the uh, from the data center view of things, from the IT view of things, just from a societal perspective. Vincent, what, what happens when we don't secure our digital supply chain? What are the things that are put at risk? Well, there's a significant number of things that are placed at risk. Um, the security of the enterprise itself, right? So your own customer data, your own internal corporate data uh, is placed at risk if there were a uh, supply chain breach. Uh, but further to that, for a software provider, and I think that in a lot of cases, most companies today are software providers or software developers. You actually put your own customers at risk as well, not just their data, but their actual, um, you know, the things that they're working on, any workloads that they may have, uh, you know, an order that they might place as an example, right? Uh, so there's a number of areas where you want to have the security of that supply chain, the software components that you have um, figured out, right? You want to be on top of that because there is that risk that trickles down uh, when it comes to any an event. I mean, we've seen that with breaches earlier this year. You know, one company is breached, multiple companies end up being breached as a result of that. So it's really important. I think we all have a part to play in that. Um, I always view it as it's not just about the company itself. So, I mean, speaking from a Red Hat perspective, I don't look at it as we're just securing Red Hat. We're securing our customers. And then we're also doing that further for their customers as well, right? Because they're writing software that's running on the software that we're providing to them. So there is this trickle down effect that comes. Uh, and so I think that every link in that chain, I mean, it's it's wonderful that it's called the supply chain, right? It's only as strong as its weakest link. So our, our view is how do we how do we strengthen every link in that chain? I mean, we're one part of it, but we're kind of looking a little broader. What can we do upstream and how can we help our customers uh, to ensure the security of their part in that supply chain? Yeah, I want to talk about that in a in a broad sense, but let's see if we can get a little bit more specific in terms of what some of these, um, what some of the chains look like, uh, because it's not just really one chain when you think about it. There's the idea of inherent flaws that can be caught, and then there and then there are the things that bad actors might be doing to leverage those flaws. So you've got all of these different things that are converging. So first, and Vincent, if you want to toss this to Luke back and forth, it's, it's up to you guys. Um, what about this issue of inherent flaws in code? We, we referenced this idea of the maintainer community. Um, how do you, what's the, what, what are best practices for locking that down to make sure that there aren't inherent uh, flaws or, or uh, uh, security risks? Yeah, I'll, I'll take a stab at it and then I'll let Luke follow up with maybe some of the technologies that Red Hat provides. But uh, And again, speaking to Red Hat as part of that chain, when we talk about inherent risk, there's a, a vulnerability that's present upstream. You know, We pull that software into to Red Hat, we package it as a component of one of the um, you know, pieces of software that we provide to our customers. It's our responsibility to pay attention to those upstream uh, potential vulnerabilities, potential risks, and correct them in, in our code, 
right? So that might be taking a patch from upstream, applying it to, to our software, might be grabbing the latest version from upstream, whatever the case might be. But it's our responsibility to uh, provide that protection for that software, to actually remediate that risk. And then our customers can then install the update and apply the mitigations themselves. Um, if we take a look at it from, you know, when we're looking at multiple suppliers, right? You'd asked earlier about, you know, what part of it is Red Hat and what part of it is, you know, self-service open source. When you look at that, the the work that Red Hat's doing there as a commercial provider of open source, an end user for that little bit that they're going to grab themselves that Red Hat doesn't provide, it's going to have to do all of those things as well. Right? They're going to have to pay attention to that risk from upstream. They're going to have to pay attention to any potential vulnerabilities and pull that in uh, to figure out, you know, do I need to patch? Where do I need to patch it? Uh, that's something we didn't really touch on was an inventory of the software that you have in place, right? I mean, you don't know that you need to fix something. You don't even know that it's running. So, I mean, there's a, a lot of considerations there where you have to pay attention to a lot of sources. Certainly there's uh, metadata, automation, all of these things that make it easier, but it doesn't absolve us of the responsibility uh, across the board to pay attention to these things, whether you're grabbing it from upstream directly or from the vendor, and it's that vendor's responsibility to then be paying attention to things upstream. Yeah, so Luke, I'm gonna, I want to, I want you to kind of riff on that from the perspective sure. that yeah. let's just assume that Vincent was, Vincent was just primarily talking about the idea that okay, we've established that this code is solid, and uh, and and we've got a you know gold copy of it, and and we know it's okay. There aren't there aren't inherent problems in the code as far as we can tell. Well, that's fine. I'm a developer. I go out to pull code in to use, how do I know if it's not been tampered with? How, how do I know if it's in fact the code that was validated during this, this process before? Uh, sure. What do you do about that? So th th there's, yeah, there's several methods there, but I, I just like to loop back to that point because I think this is really interesting around. So if you look at a, a software supply chain, okay, this is a mix of humans and machines, okay? And both have flaws, probably humans a bit more, okay? And a, su a supply chain, you have developers, okay? You have code reviewers, you have your systems administrators that set up the systems, okay? And then you have your machine actors. So you've got your build systems, uh, the various machines that are part of that supply chain, okay? Now, the the humans, there's, a, there's an attack vector there, OK, because typically they will have some sort of identity which they leverage to act for access to the to the to the supply chain. OK, so quite often a developer's identity can be compromised. OK, so a lot of the time the people will have a corporate account that gives them some sort of single sign on access to multiple systems. OK, so if a developer's account and this could be somebody in the community as well, if their account is compromised, then they're able to easily backdoor systems, okay? So that's one aspect. And then there is machines as well. There's the whole premise of machine software not being up to date. So when the latest nasty vulnerability is released, the machines updated, then the machines have their flaws, they can be exploited. So there's, there's, I would say there's a, you know, it's not just a technical problem. There is a, there's a humanistic element to this as well around protecting your supply chain. And I would say the, a really good perspective to carry when you're looking to how do I secure my supply chain is treat it like you would a production system. Okay, so what do I mean by that? When we put something into production and we've got this very long legacy of, of treating it with a very strict security context around who can access that, people, okay, how much it's upgraded and it's patched. And we seem to not have this same perception around our supply chain and our build systems, okay, the integrity of those, the access of those, the, the policy around the access and so forth. So that's one giveaway that I would say is, is a real key focus that you should have is treat it like a production system, okay, and be very mindful about what you're bringing in, who can access it, because it is the keys to the kingdom. Because if somebody compromises your supply chain, your build systems and so forth, they can compromise the whole chain. Okay, because a chain is only strong as the weakest link. So, so that's that's what I draw upon it. And around the verifications, there, there is multiple technologies that you can leverage. Okay, so Red Hat, 
we've got a re very robust signing system that we use so that you can be sure that the packages that we get you have non-repudiation that they've been produced by Red Hat. Okay, when you update your system, that's automatically looked after. Okay, and there are other systems as well. There's other new technologies that are, are starting to get a, a foothold. Okay, around the provenance of, of aspects of your build system. So when you're pulling in from these uh, multiple sources of open source communities, you can have some provenance around what you're pulling in as well. And um, yeah, there's, 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 you know, I don't want to bite shed too much on the technologies, but there's some exciting stuff starting to happen there as well. So let's look at an example of mm -hmm. something, because I, I think it's important to understand all of these different aspects. Um, recently, I think actually still in the news, um, we found that some uh, logging software uh, distributed by Apache that's widely used in uh, people's websites to gather information about uh, to help you know, to help from a security perspective and to help from uh, to help developers improve uh, things that are going on in websites, um, a vulnerability was discovered. Uh, I guess first Alibaba, some folks re reported it directly to some folks at Ap Apache in the Apache organization. Uh, and then uh, of all people, some folks from Minecraft uh, mentioned it in a blog. Um, that seems like a crazy way to find out about something that's a critical uh, a critical flaw. Now we're looking at that at this right now with hindsight. So with hindsight, mm -hmm. what could we have done uh, to to not be in the circumstances that we're in right now? Uh, Vincent, I'll toss that to you first. But again, if but if again, uh, if, if, uh, uh, if Luke is more appropriate, more, let us know. No, it's it's a it's a great question, and uh, it's a hard. How did question. you let this happen, Vincent? How did you let this happen? <laughs> it wasn't me. I promise. <laughs> um, but I mean, it, it is, it's, it's a challenging, it's a challenging question. I mean, and there's a number of areas where, I mean, we focused on a lot of what we perceived as critical software, right? So it comes to web server applications, DNS, uh, a number of the kind of the critical infrastructure, the powers of the internet, uh, right or wrong, you know, do we look at logging software as a, as a critical piece of that? Well, well, maybe, maybe we should. Right, logging is definitely important as part of uh, an incident response or just an awareness of what's going on. So, I mean, yeah, it probably should have been considered critical software. There's also, I mean, it's open source, right? So there's a number of different logging applications. And I imagine now uh, we're scrutinizing those a little bit more, but, you know, looking beforehand, how do you determine what's critical and uh, until an event like this happens? And it, it's unfortunate that it happens, um, and I like to think of these as uh, learning opportunities, you know, certainly not just for Red Hat, but for, uh, I mean, this touches no, on. Of course. Yeah, yeah, this certainly, this is, not, everybody. Yeah, this is not an indictment of our entire industry. We are all in this together and learning every day. It just highlights how complex the situation is that we're dealing with. Right. It, oh, it truly is. And I mean, a lot of what we're, what we're looking at now is how do we get tools into the hands of developers? Uh, who can catch some of these things earlier, right? And there's a lot of, uh, you know, commercial offerings. There's a lot of open source tools that are, are available and, and being produced uh, that are going to help with these sorts of situations moving forward. But, I mean, all the tools on the planet aren't going to help if they're not being used, right? So, I mean, there's there has to be an education and incentive for these developers, you know, particularly maybe in some upstream communities where they are labors of love and they're, they're, they're passion projects. They're not sponsored or, or backed by a corporation uh, who's paying for these tools, right? To be able to use some of them um, and, and move that forward. I think that, you know, looking at things now, there is work to be done. Obviously, there's always going to be work to be done. Not all of these tools, and we have to recognize this, they're not all perfect. They're not going to catch everything. These tools could have been, I mean, I don't know if, if they were running these tools or not. They could have been. And the tools simply could not have picked them up. So part of it is the proactive part. You know, we talk a lot about shift left and, and moving these things early into the development process. And that's great, and we should do it. It certainly should never be seen as a silver bullet or a replacement for a good response. And I think what the really important thing to highlight with respect to this, and I mean, this touches on the supply chain issue as well. Companies, especially those who never maybe saw themselves as a software development company, really have to figure out and understand how to do appropriate response. 
part of that is uh, awareness. You know, what, what do you have installed? Part of it is uh, sources of information, like how do I find out about a new vulnerability or a potential vulnerability? And then it's just this, the speed to respond, right? We know that a number of uh, companies, they have, you know, maybe it's a patch Tuesday, maybe it's a patch 26th of the month, maybe it's patch day of the quarter, right? We have to learn how to respond to these things quickly so that we can apply these mitigations and these fixes as quickly as possible uh, to then protect ourselves and protect our uh, the end users or customers that we have or to keep the kids from uh, using some backdoors in Minecraft, as it were. <laughs> Yeah, this look, this is an immensely important subject. To wrap us up on this, Luke, I'd like you to pretend that you just got in got into an elevator in a moderately tall building and you have 60 seconds to share with me someone who already trusts you. You don't have to convince me of your credentials or anything. I, I trust you. What tools specifically do you need me to be running? Tools and processes. You've got 60 seconds to say, Dave. If you're not doing these things right now, you're you're unnecessarily vulnerable. So uh, ready, ready, and go, Luke. Okay, so automatically update all packages. Okay, always stay up to date so that when an issue does hit, you're not having to go back ten versions and work your way forward. That's a key thing. Uh, ensure that everything that you pull in. You're not going to hit 100%, but have a very strict requirement that there is non-repudiation. It's signed content, so you can verify that it's not been tampered with. Okay, For your developers that are producing code, run static, dynamic analysis, API fuzzers, all of these sorts of tools, they will find some vulnerabilities for you. Um, be part of communities, okay? Be part of communities. Help chop the wood and carry the water. Because the log4j, the thing is, that was found because it was in the open, okay? If it wasn't in the open, it wouldn't have been found. And I've been in this business for a long time. Software developers will always write bugs, okay? I do. Some of them will be security bugs. That's never gonna change, okay? So it's not about stopping something that's inevitable. It's about being prepared to react, to, to react accordingly in a right and correct manner when it does happen so that you can mitigate against those risks. Well, we're here on the 35th floor. Uh, that was oh. that was amazing. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Luke. Uh, Vincent, you were in the elevator also listening in on this conversation. conversation. Did, 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 did you miss anything? No, I mean, the only thing I'll, I'll say is that it's really helpful to partner with an, an enterprise open source provider, uh, be, it, be it Red Hat or anybody else. I don't want to toot our own horn, right? Um, they do a lot of that work on your behalf that you don't have to do. A lot of the things that Luke was talking about, those providers do. So you don't have to, right? And that's where you, you know, I like that you talked about, hey, you don't have to convince me that you, that that I'm trusted, right? Or that I trust you. Um, trust, trust those vendors. They're literally here to do a lot of that heavy lifting for you um, and trust the process. Yeah, it's a very, it's a very, very good point. Uh, and I know that uh, sometimes it's hard to get to that point where you, you are the trusted advisor. Uh, both of you certainly are. Uh, and uh, with that, I would like to thank you very much for an interesting conversation. Gentlemen, let's uh, keep in touch. You're, also, you're always welcome on the Cube. Luke, second time getting a chance to talk to you on the Cube personally. Fantastic. Uh, with that, I would like to thank everyone for joining this very special series on the Cube, managing risk in the digital supply chain is a critical topic to keep on top of. Thanks for tuning into the Cube. We'll be back soon. I'm Dave Nicholson saying thanks again. In a moment, Kirsten Newcomer, who is the director of cloud and DevSecOps strategy at Red Hat, joins Dave Vellante. You're watching the Cube, the global leader in tech coverage. What's the most powerful technology ever invented? Electricity? The internet? Nuclear power? The printing press? Laser swords? Maybe our most transformative tool isn't technology at all, but a simple conversation between two humans. So join me for Technically Speaking, an all new series of informal, casual conversations exploring all things technology, from edge computing to Kubernetes to hybrid cloud and what's on the horizon. Hello, everyone.
everyone, my name is Dave Vellante and we're digging into the many facets of the software supply chain and how to better manage digital risk. I'd like to introduce Kirsten Newcomer, who is the Director of Cloud and DevSecOps Strategy at Red Hat. Hello, Kirsten, welcome. Hello, Dave, great to be here with you today. Let's dive right in. What technologies and practices should we be thinking about that can help improve the security posture within the software supply chain? So I think the most important thing for folks to think about really is adopting DevSecOps. Um, and while organizations talk about DevSecOps, right, or, and, and many folks have adopted DevOps, they tend to forget the security part of DevSecOps. And, and so for me, DevSecOps is both DevSec, how do I shift security left into my supply chain, and SecOps, which is a better understood and more common piece of the puzzle, but then closing that loop between what issues are discovered in production and feeding that back to the development team to ensure that we're really addressing that supply chain. Yeah, I, I heard a stat, I don't know what the source is, I don't know if it's true, but it, but it probably is that, that around 50% of the organizations in North America don't even have a SecOps team uh, now, of course, that probably includes a lot of smaller organizations, but if they don't have a SecOps team, they're not doing DevSecOps. Uh, but so what are organizations doing for supply chain security today? Yeah, I think the most common practice that people have adopted is vulnerability scanning. And so they will do that as part of their development process. They might do it at one particular point. They might do it at more than one point. But one of the challenges that, that we see, first of all, is that that's the only security uh, gate that they've integrated into their supply chain, into their pipeline. So they may be scanning code that they get externally, they may be scanning their own code. But the second challenge is that the results are take so much work to triage, right? This is static vulnerability scanning. You get information that is not in full context because you don't know whether a vulnerability is truly exploitable unless you know how exposed that particular uh, part of the code is to the internet, for example, um, or to, to other aspects. And so it's just a real challenge for organizations who are only looking at static vulnerability data to figure out what the right steps to take are to manage those. And there's no, there's, there's no way we're going to wind up with zero vulnerabilities in, in the code that we're all working with today. Things just move too quickly. Is that idea of vulnerability scanning, is it almost like you know, sampling where you may or may not find the, the, the weakest link? Uh, I, I wouldn't, I, I would say that it's, it's more comprehensive than that. The vulnerability scanners that are, that are available are, are generally pretty strong, but they're, again, if it's a static environment, a lot of them rely on NVD database, which, which typically is going to give you the worst case scenario, and by nature can't account for things like was the software that you're scanning built with um, uh, controls, uh, you know, mitigations built in, right? It's just going to tell you this is the package and this is the vul known vulnerabilities associated with that package. It's not going to tell you whether there were compiler time flags that maybe mitigated that vulnerability. And so it's, it's almost overwhelming for organizations to prioritize that information and really understand it in context. And, and so when I think about the closed loop feedback, you really want not just that static scan, but also analysis that takes into account the configuration of the application and the runtime environment and any mitigations that might be present there. I see, thank you for that. So, you know, given that this digital risk and software supply chains are now front and center, we read about them all the time now, what, how do you think was, organizations are responding. What's the future of software supply chain yeah. going to look like? That's a great one. So I think organizations are scrambling. We've certainly at Red Hat, we've, we've seen an increase in questions about Red Hat's own supply chain security. And, and we've um, got uh, lots of information that we can share and make available. But I think also we're starting to see uh, this strong increased interest in security bill of materials. So I actually uh, started working with um, automation and, and standards around security bill of materials a number of years ago. I participated in the Linux Foundation SPDX project. There are other projects like Cyclone DX, but I think 
all organizations are going to need to, those of us who deliver software, we're going to need to provide SBOMs and consumers of our software should be looking for SBOMs to help them understand, to build transparency across the projects and to facilitate that automation. Um, you, can, you can leverage the data in a, in a software package list to get a quick view of vulnerabilities. Again, you don't have that runtime uh, context yet, but it saves you that step perhaps of having to do the initial scanning. Um, and, and then there are additional things that folks are looking like, right? That looking at attested pipelines is gonna be key for building your custom software. Um, as you pull the code uh, in and your developers build their solutions, their applications, being able to, to vet the steps in your pipeline and attest that nothing has happened in that pipeline is really going to be key. So the software bill of material is going to give you a, a granular picture of mm -hmm. you know, your software and then what, the, the chain of, of provenance, if you will? Or? Uh, well, the, an SBOM, depending on the format, an SBOM absolutely can provide a chain of provenance. Um, but another thing, when, it, when we think about it from the security angle, so there's the provenance, right? Where, where did this come from? Who provided it to me? Uh, but also with that bill of materials, that list of packages, you can, you can leverage tooling that will, associate, that will give you information about vulnerability information about those packages. At Red Hat, we don't think that vulnerability info should be included in the SBOM because vulnerability data changes every day. Um, but it, it saves you a step potentially, right? Then you don't necessarily have to be so concerned about doing the scan. You can pull data about known vulnerabilities for those packages without a scan. Similarly, the, the attestation in the pipeline, that's about things like ensuring that um, the code that you pull into your pipeline is signed, right? Signatures are in many ways a more important piece uh, for defining provenance and, and getting trust. Got it. So I was talking to a CISO the other day and I was asking her, okay, what are your main challenges? Kind of the standard mm -hmm. analyst questions, if you will. And she, she said, look, I, I got great people, but I just don't have enough depth of talent to handle you know, the, 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 the challenges. I'm, I'm always sort of playing, playing catch up. And so I, I, one leads that, that leads one to the conclusion, okay, automation is potentially an answer to address that problem. But at the same time, people have said to me, you know, sometimes we put too much faith in automation, so I'm saying, okay, help, Kirsten, help me square this circle. I want to automate because I lack the talent, but it, it's it, it's not it's su not sufficient. How do I? What are your thoughts on automation? Uh, so, so I think I think in the world we're in today, especially with cloud native applications, you can't manage without automation because things are moving too quickly. So, so I think the way that you assess whether automation is meeting your goals is becomes critical. And so looking for external guidance, um, such as the NIST Secure Software Development Framework, that can help. Um, but, but again, when we come back, I, I think look for an opinionated position uh, from the vendors, from the folks you're working with, from your advisors, on what are the appropriate set of gates. And we've talked about vulnerability scanning, but analyzing the config data for your apps is just as important. Right, and, and so I think we have to work together as an industry to figure out what are the key security gates, how do we audit the automation so that I can validate that automation and be comfortable that it is actually meeting the needs. But I don't, I don't see how we move forward without automation. Excellent, thank you. So given, I mean, we were, we were forced into digital uh, without a yep. lot of thought. Um, some some folks, you know, it's a spectrum. Some organizations in better shape than others, but many <laughs> had to just dive right in without a lot of strategy. And now people have sat back and said, okay, let's be more planful, more thoughtful. So as you, and then of course you got, you know, the supply chain hacks, et cetera. How do you think the whole narrative and the strategy is going to change? How should it change the way in which we create, maintain, you know, consume software as, as both organizations and individuals. Yeah, so, so again, I think there's going to be um, 
and the, the, there's already you know a need request for more transparency from software vendors. This is a place where uh, SBOMs play a role. Um, but there's also right a lot of conversation out there about zero trust. So so what does that mean? In you know you, you have to have a relationship with your vendor that uh, provides transparency that so that you can assess the level of trust. You also have to, in your organization, determine, uh, to your point earlier about people with skills and automation, how do you trust but verify, right? This is not just with your vendor, but also with your internal supply chain, right? So trust and, and verify remains key. That's That's been a concept that's been around for a while. Uh, Cloud Native doesn't change that, but it may change the tools that we use. Um, and we may also decide what are our trust boundaries, right? Are they, where, where are we comfortable trusting? Where do we think that zero trust is a more applicable place, uh, a more applicable frame to apply? But I, but I do think back to the, the automation piece. And again, you know, it is hard for everybody to keep up. I think we have to break down silos. We have to ensure that teams are talking across those silos so that we can leverage each other's skills. Uh, and, and we need to think about managing everything as code. What I like about the everything as code, as code, including security, is it does create auditability in new ways, right? If you're managing your infrastructure in a GitOps-like approach, your security policies with a GitOps-like approach, it provides visibility and auditability, and it enables your dev team to participate in new ways. So when you talk about zero trust, I think, okay, it, I can't trust users. <laughs> I got to trust but very my users, no. machines, em employees, my software, right. my, my partners, <laughs> my, yeah. e every, every possible connection point. Absolutely, and, and this is where both attestation and identity become key, right? So being able to, I mean, the, the Solar Winds team has done a really interesting set of things with their supply chain uh, after they after they were in, in response to the hack they were dealing with, right? They're now using Tekton CD chains to ensure that they have um, attested every step in their supply chain process and that they can replicate that with automation. So they're doing a combination of, yep, we've got humans who need to interact with the chain and then we can validate every step in that chain. Um, and then workload identity, right, is a, is a key thing for us to think about too. So how do we assert identity for the workloads that are being deployed to the cloud and, and you know, verify whether that's with Spiffy Spire or related projects, verify that uh, the workload is the one that we meant to deploy and also runtime behavioral analysis. I know we've been talking about supply chain, but, but again, I think we have to do this closed loop, right? You can't just think about shifting security left. And, and I know you mentioned earlier, right? A lot of teams don't have SecOps but there are solutions available that help assess the behavior in runtime, and that information can be fed back to the app dev team to help them adjust and verify and validate where do I need to tighten my security. I'm glad you brought up the solar winds uh, to yeah. Kirsten, what they're doing. It was, I remember you know, after 9-11, everyone was afraid to fly, but it was probably the safest right. time in history to fly. Uh, and, and so same analogy here, solar winds probably has learned more about this and, his Absolutely. reputation took a huge hit, but if you had to compare you know, what Solar Winds has learned and applied at the speed at which they've done it with maybe some other software suppliers, you might find that they've actually done a better job. It's just unfortunate they've, yeah. they something hit that we never saw before. It was, to me, it was Stuxnet-like. We'd never seen anything like this before, right. and then boom. It, it, we've entered yeah. a whole new era. I'll give you the, the last word, Kirsten. Um, no, just, just to agree with you. And I, I think, again, as an industry, it's pushed us all to think harder and more, uh, and more carefully about where do we need to improve? What tools do we need to, to build to help ourselves? You know, again, SBOMs have been around 
you know, for a good 10 years or so, but they are enjoying a resurgence of, of importance. Signing, image signing, manifest signing, that's been around for ages, but we haven't made it easy to integrate that into the supply chain. And that's work that's happening today. Similarly, the attestation of a supply chain, of a pipeline, that's happening. So I think as a, as a industry, um, we've all recognized uh, that, that we need to step, step up and, and there's a lot of creative energy going into improving in this space. Excellent. Kirsten Newcomer, thanks so much for your perspectives. Excellent conversation. My pleasure. Thanks so much. When we return, Andrea Hall, along with Andrew Block, both from Red Hat, will join me. You're watching The Cube, the global leader in enterprise tech coverage. And we can have this in market by end of quarter. End of quarter? Yep. Well, there might be a few global requirements that you forgot to consider. All of our data has to be stored on private clouds. We can do that. That's fine. Our developers need to be able to use the tools that they already have. You got it. We have critical services on VMs. Not a problem. Not a problem. We're building on a really flexible platform. Like really flexible. Okay then, let's get started. Okay, we're here talking about how you can better understand and manage the risks associated with the digital supply chain. How in this day and age where software be comes from so many different places and sources throughout the ecosystem, how can organizations manage the risks associated with our dependence on software? And with me now are two great guests. Andrea Hall, who is a specialist solution architect and project manager for security and compliance at Red Hat. He's got a focus on public sector. And Andrew Block, who's a distinguished architect at Red Hat Consulting. Folks, welcome. Thank welcome. You. Thanks for having us. You're very welcome. So Andrea, let's start with, with you. Let's talk about regulations. What exists today that we should be aware of that organizations should be paying attention to? Oh, sure. So um, the thing that comes to mind first being in the U.S. is the presidential executive order on cybersecurity that came out a few months ago. Um, organizations are really paying attention to that. And, uh, you know, in the U.S., it's having a ripple effect with policy. Uh, but we're also seeing uh, policy considerations pop up in other countries, Australia and England. Uh, so, the supply chain is a big focus right now, of course, uh, but we we see these changes coming down the road as, as more and more uh, government organizations are trying to secure uh, their critical infrastructure. Is there, is there kind of a leadership approach? In other words, is somebody so you're seeing what the UK does and saying, okay, we're going to follow that template, or is it sort of uh, just a, a variety and a mishmash uh, with... With, with no sort of consolidation. How, how is that sort of playing out? Um, I see a lot of organizations kind of basing uh, their requirements on NIST 800-171, I'm sorry, NIST 853. Uh, however, you know, each organization has its own nuances. Each agency has its own nuances to how it wants it implemented. Great. Uh, Andrew, maybe you could chime in here. What are you seeing when you talk to customers that are, that are tuned into this issue? You know, as Andrea just mentioned, having that North Star in terms of regulations is so fundamentally great for them because many of them, especially in regulate, regulatory industries, look to these regulations on how they apply their own policies. So at least we have some guidance on how to move forward because as we all know, the secure software supply chain is getting news every day and how they act to it is something that I know all their leaders are asking themselves, especially those IT leaders. So Andrea, you know, when I talk to practitioners, they, they sometimes they're frustrated 
they, they understand they have to comply. They, knew, they know new regulations are coming out, but sometimes it's hard for them to, to keep up. So it would be helpful if, if you're sitting across the table from somebody who's frustrated and they ask you, what are your expectations? How do you see, you know, the, what are the trends in regulations? How do you see the current regulations evolving to specifically accommodate the digital supply chain and the security exposures and, and, and corollary requirements there? I see a lot of organizations struggling in the sense of trying to understand what the policy actually wants. Um, definitions are still a little bit vague, uh, but implementation is also difficult um, because you know, sometimes organizations will add more tools to their toolkit, um, adding a layer of complexity there. Uh, it's you know, really automation has to be pulled in. Um, that's key to implementing this instead of adding more workload and more burden to your folks. Uh, it's really important for these organizations to pull uh, the stakeholders in the organization together. So the IT leaders bring together the developers, the security uh, uh, operations, sit at the same table, talk about whether or not um, what needs to be implemented or what's proposed to be implemented will affect the mission in any way or disrupt operations. It's important for everybody to be on the same page so it doesn't slow anything down um, as, as uh, you're trying to roll it out. And one of the things here is that we're seeing a lot of change with these new regulations and with a lot of organizations, any type of change is scary. And that is one area that they're looking for guidance, not only in the tooling, but also how they apply it in the organization. Well, we'll and I'll add on. Please. I'll add on to that and say, you know, um, organizations really need to take into account the people side of things too. Uh, people need to understand what the impact is to the organization so that they, uh, you know, don't try to find the loopholes. Uh, they're, they're buying into what needs to be done. Uh, they understand the why behind it. Um, you know, for example, like if you walk into your house, you normally close the door behind you. Um, security needs to be seen as that, you know, as well. That's the culture and it's the habit and it's ingrained in the uh, fabric of the organization uh, to uh, live this way, not just implement the tools to do it. Right, and the number of doors you have in, in your infrastructure are a lot more than just a couple. Um, Andrew mentioned sort of guidance. And governments are obviously taking a more active role. I mean, sometimes I'm a cynic. I mean, great that President Biden signs an executive order, but this you know, swipe of a pen doesn't really give us enough to go on. Do you think, Andrea, that we're gonna see new guidance from governments in the, in the very near future? What are you expecting? Um, I, I expect to see um, more conversations happening. Uh, so I know that uh, organized agencies that, who develop the policies are pulling together stakeholders and getting input. But I do see in the not too distant future that mandates will be rolling out, yes. Well, so Andrew and of course, Andrea, if you have a thought on this as well, but how do you see organizations you know, dealing with adopting these new policies? Slowly, don't boil the ocean is one thing I tell to every one of them because a lot, a lot of these tooling, a lot of these concepts are foreign to them, brand new. How they adopt those and how they implement them needs to be done in a very agile fashion, very slow and you know prescriptive. Go ahead and try to find one area of improvement and go ahead and work upon it and build upon it because not only does that not only, not only make your organization more successful and secure, but also helps your organization just from a morale standpoint. One thing that you need to emphasize is that don't blame anyone because a lot of times when you're going through this, you're reassessing your, your own supply chain and might find where you could see improvements that need to be done. Don't blame things that may have occurred in the past see how you can benefit from these lessons learned in the future. You know, it's interesting you say that about the blame game. I mean, it, it, it used to be that failure meant f you get fired. And that's obviously is, is changed. Uh, it's not about, as many have said, you, you know you're going to have incidents. It's how you respond to those incidents, what you learn from them. Do you have, Andrew, any insights from specifically working with customers on securing their software supply chain? What, what can you tell us about what leading practitioners are doing today? They're going in and, and not only assessing what, what their software components consist of, using tools like 
an SBOM, a software bill of materials to understand where all the components of their ecosystem and their lineage comes from. So we, we're hearing almost every single day new vulnerabilities that are being introduced in, in various software packages. By having that understanding of what is in your ecosystem, you can then better understand how to mitigate those concerns moving forward. So Andrea, you know, Andrea was just saying, one of the things is you, you don't just dive in, you got to be careful. There's going to be ripple effects is what I'm inferring. But at the same time, you know, there's a mandate to move quickly. So are, are there things that could accelerate the, the, the adoption of regulation or even the creation of, of regulations and, and that guidance in your view, what could accelerate this? Uh, as far as accelerating it goes, I think it's having those pro conversations proactively with the stakeholders in your organization and understanding the environment, like Andrew said, go ahead and get that baseline uh, and, and just know that whatever changes you make are maybe going to be audited down the road um, because as we we're moving towards this uh, kind of third party verification that you're actually implementing things in order to do business with another organization. So the importance of that, uh, if organizations see that, um, that, that gravity to this, uh, I think they will try to you know, speed things up. Um, I, I think that uh, if organizations uh, and the people in those organizations understand that why that I talked about earlier, uh, and they understand how it, uh, things like solar winds or things like the, um, the uh, uh, oil um, disruption that happened earlier this year, the personal effects of cyber events will help your organization move forward. Again, everybody's bought into the concept, everybody's working towards the same goals, and they understand that why behind it. In, in addition to that, having tooling available that makes it easy for them. You have a lot of individuals who this is all foreign, providing that base level tooling that aligns to a lot of the regulations that might be applicable within their realm and their domain makes it easier for them to start to complying and taking less burden off of them to be able to be successful. So it's, it's a hard problem because <laughs> how do you, how, how do you deal, Andrew, how do you deal with sort of the comment, uh, uh, more tools, okay. But I look at that, the Optiv ma map, if you've seen that, it's just, it's, it makes your eyes cross. Um, so you've got so many tools, so much fragmentation are you, you're introducing new tools. Can automation help that? Is there is there is there hope for consolidation of that tools portfolio? Right now, this space is very emerging. It's very emerging. It's very fluid, to be honest, because the executive mandates only you know, a year or two old as they come you know over over the course of time. However, I do see these types of tooling starting to consolidate. Where right now, it seems like every vendor has a tool that tries to address this. It's being able to have the, the people work together, have more regulations that will come out that will allow us to start to redefine and solidify on certain tools like ISO standards. Um, there are certain ones that I mentioned on S-Bombs previously. There's now a ISO standard on S-Bombs. There wasn't previously. So as more and more of these regulations come out, it makes it easier to provide that reg recommended set of tooling that organizations can start leveraging instead of vendor A, vendor B. So, Andrea, I, I said it before I was a cynic, but we'll give you the last word. Give us some hope. I mean, obviously, public policy is very important, a partnership between governments and, and industry, both the practitioners, the organizations that are buying these tools, as well as the technology industry, got to work together in, in an ecosystem. Uh, give us some hope. The, the, the hope, I think, will come from uh, realizing that as you're doing this, as you are implementing these changes, you're, you know, in, in a sense, prevent trying to prevent those future incidents from happening. So there's, there's some assurance that you're doing everything that you can do here. Um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a, a situation, um, you know, it can be daunting, you know, I'll put it that way. It can be really daunting for organizations, but just know that uh, organizations like Red Hat are doing what we can to help you down the road. Great. And really it's, it's just continuing this whole shifting left mentality. This, you know, the software supply chain is just one component, but really introducing DevSecOps security at the beginning that really 
will make the organizations become successful because this is not just a technology problem. It's a people, people issue as well. And being able to kind of package them all up together will help organizations as a whole. Yeah, so that's a really important point. You know, you hear that term shift left. For years, you heard you know, people say, hey, you can't just bolt security on as an, as an afterthought. That's problematic. And that's really, that's the answer to, to that, that problem, right? Is shifting left, meaning designing it in at the point of, of code, infrastructure as code, DevSecOps, that's where it starts, right? Exactly, being able to have security at the forefront and then have everything afterwards you know, propagate from your security mindset. Excellent. Okay, Andrea, Andrew, thanks so much for coming to the program today. Thank you for having us. So look, I wish I could say there's an end to these threats. There isn't. They will continue indefinitely. The adversaries, they're well-funded, they're motivated, and they're sophisticated. Your job as practitioners is to try and make it less profitable for the hackers. At the end of the day, this is a business for them. And the hackers, what do they want? They want value. It's all about ROI for them. That means benefit over cost. If you can increase the denominator, it lowers their value. And they're going to go elsewhere and they'll fish in more productive places. The hard reality is that bad user practices will trump good security every time. And that's where the vulnerability starts. So shoring up the basics, that's table stakes. Now beyond that, working with strong technology partners can bring expertise to complement your team's skills and reduce the threat against these sophisticated attacks. We hope this program was informative and will inspire you to take action. All these videos, they're available on demand at thecube.net and both the Cube's and Red Hat's social channels and a variety of other places that we'll share with the community. Thanks to all our guests today. For Dave Nicholson and the entire Cube team, this is Dave Vellante. Appreciate you watching, and we'll see you next time.